Vikinger Olofsson, I'm glad we could talk about Mozart and contemporaries and some of the other things that you have on your on your plate right now. And I want to talk about the concert that you're going to be doing in the United States, which is Mozart and contemporaries. And it's something that I have never seen anyone else do, which is play an entire album from start to finish and asking the audience not to applaud as if they are listening to the album live in front of them. What's the logic behind that? And also, how has your relationship to this work that was released two years ago evolved since that time? Well, it was great to speak with you, Craig. I mean, I, I basically, well, there are two answers. I mean, yes, two years ago that I recorded this, it was released like a year and a half ago. I mean, at this point, I don't think of it as Mozart and contemporaries, but rather Wolfie and Co. Uh, I mean, I love this program. And those are actually the very last concerts I will ever play this in, in the United States and anywhere, you know. So it's just kind of the end of uh, a big project for me. I've played it throughout the whole world. I mean, the idea with the programming and the way it works from the first piece to the last, you know, and why I ask people to sort of go into this sort of state of mind with me and allow one piece to speak to the other and merge almost into the next, melt together almost. It's because I love to think of my albums and recital programs as a kind of a collage, you know, not pretending they are compositions in a way, but but I still, there is there is that thought in my head when I'm creating my albums that I want them to function somehow as a unity from the first to the last piece. I've actually never in my life played a, an album like that from beginning to end without changing anything. I mean, when I was touring my Bach album, my Debussy Rameau albums, my other albums, I'm usually playing one half the album with some sort of a compilation I, I create and then I'm doing something completely different in the second half. But the most of one, I tried that. I, I couldn't find what to erase um, from this program. And it is really kind of like going from light uh, into the shadow. You know, there, there's a lot of playfulness and a lot of sort of playful exchange between Mozart and the other composers in the first sort of part of the program. And then as it progresses, it gets darker and darker and, and more and more difficult, actually, but also more romantic and denser and in a way greater. Um, and that is very much like Mozart's last 10 years, you know, that began quite wonderfully. And then as his art progressed ever higher, his popularity and his standing in the music world went ever lower, you know, and it's such a paradox. It's a strange thing. Uh, and, then, you know, in certain parts of his life, when he was at his most creative, like when he wrote the string quintet in G minor, I'm playing the Adagio and E flat from that piece, my own transcription. When he wrote that piece, he started a, um, uh, like a subscription model for his you know, publishing for his print. It was in a way very progressive like that, one of the first indie musicians. And do you know how many people he got, Craig, for this subscription model? One. Not even his wife. <laughs> 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 I mean, if I were if I were Constance, Constance, I would probably sort of secretly subscribe. But but I mean, he had only one. I mean, it, and that was, I think, in 17, what is this, 89, perhaps, uh, or something like that. Anyway, um, so that's the idea with the program and why I ask people to not applaud. It's also uh, because there's usually a very specific idea of putting Mozart's work right next to Cimarosa, Galuppi, Haydn, whoever it is, uh, Karl Philipp Manuel Bach. Uh, usually I would put maybe a rondo of Mozart next to a rondo of someone else. And then I really want them to sort of function in that sense, you know. I put the Mozart D minor fantasy, the incomplete one, you know, right next to the D major rondo. So it almost becomes like a prelude and fugue or a fantasy and a fantasy and rondo, if you wish, you know. There are all these kinds of things, you know, the F minor uh, galoopy piece at the beginning, which is maybe the most modern thing on the whole program, a piece without melody, just rhythm and harmonies, almost like minimalism in that sense. I mean, that, that goes directly from F minor into Mozart's F major rondo, that then a second piece of the program appears sort of like, just, just from heaven, <laughs> you know, I mean, that it's very angelic, that opening of the, of the Rondo of Mozart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very long answer to your short question about why I do this. <laughs> um, well, you talk about how it gets darker and darker, but when you get to list transcription of the Ave Maria at the end, it's just heavenly. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, I listen to that and it's just like, all awareness of the world around me is gone. Well, thank you. I think I think the same of this music. These are maybe the greatest three minutes ever composed. I mean, you know, Mozart wrote this in an afternoon, you know, for a friend who was celebrating Corpus Christi Mass somewhere in a small town in the middle of nowhere in Austria. He just threw it together in, in one afternoon. 
At the same time, the funny thing about Mozart is that he was always so annoyed when people, you know, claimed that he had a divine sort of talent. He always maintained that he worked harder than everybody else. And that is true. And Constanza said that he probably killed himself with overwork. But at the same time, you know, however much you, you choose to work or, you know, spend time on your art, you can't just then write a Verum Corpus once you've passed your 100,000 hours. It doesn't happen like that. Uh, and that's what makes Mozart Mozart. But I mean, yeah, this is the... This is the light at the end of the tunnel, Ave Verum, in this context. It's almost like an encore to the album and to the program. And it is almost like the afterglow of Mozart's life. It's almost like Mozart in the 19th century. This is Franz Liszt's transcription, and I think his greatest transcription, because he doesn't add any marshmallows to it. <laughs> he just takes it from D major, up a sixth, to, to, uh, to B major, makes it all the more bright somehow. And... And I just always thought the way the Adagio in B minor, which I'm playing just before, uh, which is maybe Mozart's most, if you can say so, personal keyboard work. It's an unbelievable piece of music. I mean, with these crazy modulations and all this pain and, and inner search and reflection, and just, it, it, it seems hopeless. But at the end of that piece, which is so dark, it somehow comes to terms with itself and it finds B major. It sort of melts in the most surprising way at the end into major and I thought from that B major with the low sonority and everything it would be so interesting to allow other Verum Corpus to spring like I said like Mozart you know the the myth of Mozart almost you know the Mozart the angel the Mozart the the, the yeah Mo Mozart in the 19th century um yeah the genius of Mozart immortalized by by Liszt in a way but but uh this but this piece it is interesting to put it on the piano I mean of course it is Mozart it's 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 for singers you know but something happens when you remove the text and you remove everything. It's it's almost more I don't know naked or something. It just it, it's sort of like uncomfortably beautifully beautiful actually in this transcription. Now you mentioned Mozart the Angel thirty one years ago when you were tackling the sonata in C major. I have a feeling you didn't quite think of him as an angel then. No, I hated him. I mean, I couldn't play him. I realized for the first time that I'm not the best pianist in the world, you know, and I thought so until that point when I was about eight. And you're right, 31 years, I'm getting so old, right? But um, <laughs> but there we are. Uh, uh, and yeah, that, that I, I, I had that troubled relationship with Mozart, as I did with Bach, which is very funny because those are my two, you know, favorite composers to play. I still think they're the most difficult ones to play, but maybe that's why I love them. And maybe that's why I hated them when I was eight. I mean, but for me, I, I just, he was the first time, he was the first composer that made me realize that that nothing is good enough on the piano when you play music with that, that status and that, that kind of level, that any nuance has to almost match the nuance of the composition. And that is in itself just an impossible task. You just can't expect to reach that height of piano playing, you know, no one will. But that's somehow what Mozart seems to demand. And the, the fact with Mozart is what makes him him is that he's so specific. He's you know, when you look at the F major rondo or any piece on the program, but the F major rondo is a good example because the rondo has the recurring theme coming, I don't know how many times, but every time it comes, it's the same, except it's not. He twists something. He never repeats himself. And that's the beauty of it. He always seems to be able to find one more perspective on the same material that a lesser composer and basically all composers simply wouldn't find. So I often think people are like saying that Mozart, you know, what makes him him and he's so similar in style to the other composers. That's not the point. The point is that he always finds yet another nuance and he's simply more specific, just like any great pianist who is, you know, a great pianist. He's simply more specific in his choices with how the piano sounds and certainly any great composers. It's, it's the specificity of, of that, that, that makes art art and certainly makes Mozart Mozart. Now, you referenced the fact that Mozart and Bach are your favorite composers to play. You've mentioned that that you could play them for six, seven hours in a day and not get tired, you know, of, of playing their music. But there's, you know, you don't have the ability to talk to them the way you can talk to Thomas Otis, you know, or John Adams about what they've done. But if you could go back in time, or if you could bring them to present day, Mozart and Bach, what would be, what would you most want to know about about why they wrote the way they did or about their work or who they were? That's a good question. It's like an impossible question, of course. I mean, first of all, I would just try to go and hear, hear them play and hopefully the same music on two consecutive nights to get confirmation for what I'm absolutely certain is true, that they would never repeat themselves and play, let's say, the Goldberg variation twice the same or the C minor sonata in case of Mozart. I'm sure he wouldn't do it. I'm sure he would. And now I'm not just talking about ornamentation or like little little things like that. Sorry about this noise here in the background. 
Um, but I'm talking about like actual tempo. So I'm talking about phrasings and dynamics and, and the detail within the detail, you know. Second of all, I would just go up to them and ask them, how can I help you? Can I do your laundry? Uh, do you need money? Um, can, I, can I just do something for you? Because those guys, they didn't enjoy what they should have enjoyed in their life. You know, they, they had a very difficult life and they had to work, you know, more than we probably understand and comprehend today. Um, certainly not something the unions and the United States would ever accept. You know, it's it's, it's really it's it's, it's really un, un, it's it's really unthinkable the output they managed in the short span of time. So, uh, but I would I would probably also um, ask Mozart what he wanted from his instrument because the instrument was changing so much. And I feel in the C minor sonata, which is the biggest keyboard sonata and one of the biggest pieces he ever wrote in a way for, for keyboard, um, I would ask him. Are you content with the instrument? Uh, you know, because he seems to me to be pushing in the late works, pushing the boundaries of, of the instrument, of the forte piano, or you know, whatever his instrument was at his disposal. He's pushing it so far. I would love to hear his thoughts about the pros and cons of the piano of the day and how he would ideally have the piano develop. Now we know the grand piano as it is today, and it's a wonderful invention about 100, 120 or 30 years old since it, you know, sort of stopped evolving more or less, more or less. Um, but I, th that would be something very interesting to me. With Bach, of course, if I would be back in Bach's day, I would, yeah, I would like to hear him play on the harpsichord, but what I would really want to hear him is play the organ and hear how he would register the organ, uh, just to get a sense for his colors and what, 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 what he would be going for. And then I would go back in the time machine and, and travel to 2023 and, and maybe try to recreate some of that on the on the piano because I think the piano has that potential. Uh, but I'm pretty sure also if I could bring a piano with me back in time to those guys, uh, I think that would be the best present they would ever receive without being able to say that, of course. But, but I, I think they would love the potential of it, and the polyphony and the way you can differentiate the different voices, you know. What would you ask them? I mean, this is like an impossible question, but it's an interesting question, actually. It is an it, it is an impossible question, but you know, I I grew up actually. I started playing the organ um, mm. instead of the piano. I didn't switch to the piano until I was in high school. Okay. Uh, so I was playing a lot of Bach preludes and fugues, and 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 you know, I just want to know how you get into the place where you can write such divine work. How do how do you? I mean, obviously, the noises and everything that we have now you know, seem like they're probably impossible and utter chaos to us. But I have to assume that there were different kinds of distractions and noise and chaos at, during their times as well. So how do you get to that place where you can just put it all on paper and then and then play it so remarkably? Because it's the I, enigma. It I is, mean, it's, the, 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 this, it's, it, it would probably be so disappointing to get an answer to this beautiful question, don't you think? I mean, you don't, you don't actually don't want to know the answer, right? Because there is, I mean, you can't, they would probably, I think they love the process perhaps more than anyone else. I mean, I can just, you know, imagine the hours they would have spent. And, and the interesting thing about Bach, and a little bit like Mozart in the last 10 years, is that he seems, they both seem to take the music of the past 200 years before them, and somehow just sort of managed to merge it all into their own voice. They seem to be very, to me, they seem very curious people. I mean, Bach certainly knew, and he was, you know, devouring music that he got, got, got his hands on. And Mozart, for instance, when Mozart discovers the music of Bach, the J.S. Bach, uh, sort of by coincidence in 1781 almost, in a library in Vienna, it changes everything for him, and he just becomes obsessed. And you see that process through the transcriptions that he did, and you see it coming into his work. And I think that this kind of curiosity about the past might be the key to to some degree to 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 that that kind of level of ingenuity. Well, I also think Bach's devotion to God had a huge part of, in that too. I mean, if you look at a lot of things that he said or is quoted as saying or writing, you know, it was constantly in 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 reverence to God. So I think in his case, that belief in an ultimate deity probably mm. had a lot to do with 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 the passion that he was able to bring. And I say that as an atheist. Yeah, probably, I mean, you're probably right in a way. I mean, I think that it probably relieved him like it does, you know, anyone who, who gets very religious, it relieves you of your ego to a degree, you know, and it really relieves you of certain things uh, that, that might get in the way of creativity. But I also think Bach had, a, you know, he was just such a worker and he had so many duties and, and he was just in this kind of rhythm, it seems like, you know, for most of his life of doing everything. I mean, he was 
teaching, of course, the harpsichord, the organ, the violin. He was writing endless music for every week. And he was also the father of 20 children, 10 of which arrived and lost two wives. And he was just running it all, you know, and he was, he was teaching Latin at a point and he was, you know, conducting the choirs. I mean, how can we even comprehend any of this? And then he writes more than a thousand pieces that are beyond anything. So I think it's that he just, you know, he never got a break from it. Mozart had a much more complicated life and much more difficult social circumstances, you know, with the fame of Mozart and perhaps the ego of Mozart as well, came also obstacles and, and, and difficulties for him. You, on Mozart and contemporaries, I love that you you reintroduce us or in, in, for a contemporary audience, introduce us to composers we probably have never heard of before and we've certainly never heard their works. And I recently had a conversation with John Adams about a lot of the music that's being written now and whether or not it's going to stand the test of time. And he was very skeptical. He said, there's a lot of music that was written, you know, when Beethoven was alive that we don't know. And there's a reason because it just didn't measure up. I, although I think measuring up to Beethoven is an impossible yardstick to give anybody to have that's to true. meet. But with your album, you're proving that there is other music that we don't know. So I'm wondering as somebody who believes that we may that we're in a, a golden age of classical music do you think that in 100 or 200 years from now some of the music that might get discarded presently can be rediscovered and will be rediscovered i'm hoping you know john is writing me a piano concerto i hope that concerto is going to stand the test of time for his and for my sake and everybody's sake but i mean i i do think that uh you know, when you put someone against Mozart or Beethoven, Mozart in this case, uh, it's very difficult for, you know, for anyone. And what I had to do to construct this program, it's not like you can just open a book of Cimarosa and just pick a random sonata and that is going to be as good as the ones I arranged and put on my album. It's the same with Galuppi. I actually, and like, I, this is how I work, you know, for my albums and programs. I, I played through literally every piece of music I could find by Cimarosa for keyboard and Galuppi as well, all the sonatas, every single one. I learned them to a, to a degree, more or less. And same with every single piece of Mozart. That's how I found a few things that surprised me, like, you know, the, the G can, you know, G major, the Klein and G, G can, and all those things. But I think that actually, you know, the, the, what makes Mozart so fantastic and Bach is the kind of um, stability of, of brilliance in all their output. And But there are other artists, you know, and also throughout our times, who have an unbelievable, they, they can go extremely high in their highest and best moments, and they can have this level of inspiration, which doesn't mean that that's how they're going to, their whole, whole output is going to be like that, but that's 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 the human thing. So I think you can actually dig very deep, you know, into the chest, and, uh, and you can find many more incredibly beautiful things, like those Chimorosa sonatas, for instance, from the classical period, and I would not claim that I have looked through all the keyboard music of the classical period, not at all. I just I was just particularly interested in these composers for for different reasons, you know. Uh, but you have to spend a lot of time, and you have to you have to also develop your kind of sense of critique, critiquing the music and deciding what makes something great and what might not make something great, uh, which is something that I think we're missing in today's music education. I think that you know students should be actually encouraged to criticize also the works of Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and decide for themselves why something is great, not just accept it at face value that Opus 111 is great. It's much more interesting to be able to argue why exactly, what exactly makes that piece of music so special. Um, yeah, so, so in that sense, uh, we'll see with today. I think actually there's sadly so much music being written today that deserves a platform that, that it doesn't get um, for, for very many different reasons. But that could be said about almost anything in the world presently, uh, because we have never had anything like the kind of prosperity that we have today, which means never before have so many people been able to do something that actually interests them out of passion. Uh, so we're not having a golden age only for classical music, but in terms sense for humanity in that sense, you know, just the fact that people can develop, devote their time to, to doing something beautiful by necessity. A lot of that is unfortunately going to be forgotten and never heard. And that's Going to be difficult for people in 200 years you know and things are probably going to be even more crowded or prosperous you know so if we actually have any time or any reason to seek out unknown people from the 21st century i i don't know it's uh it's it's sort of sad but it's also very beautiful you know because the process is in in the end what matters what makes me happy as a musician is the process of of being a musician rather than a glory of a uh, of a prize or of, uh, of of project well realized or something like that. It's actually not the final product that matters, but rather the, the creative process itself. And you have to love and trust the process. And that's anyway, I think, how you have to think when you're a young musician. You know, you have to love the process, and and then perhaps you might, you know, 
find a meaningful live in music, which doesn't have to be a live of an international soloist. But if you love the process, you're anyway going to find happiness, no? Absolutely. As you're saying that, I'm reminded of a, of a Sondheim lyric in Sunday in the Park with George um, towards the end of the musical when she says, anything you do, let it come from you, then it will be new. That's great. You know, That's a great line. That's a it's great that line. That's simple, isn't it? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that line. That's a great line. Yeah. Well, it's fo it's followed up with, I chosen my world was shaken. So what? The choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was not. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, right? Bless him. Yeah, bless him. Just yeah. so amazing. amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, you mentioned that John Adams is writing uh, a concerto for you. And I know you've also been playing Must the Devil Have All the Good Tunes. Um, which I saw the world premiere performance of, and I've seen I've seen three times because I find the piece utterly compelling. And as a, as as a lapsed piano performance major, I find it intensely difficult to contemplate doing. Um, <laughs> how it is that work as challenging as it seems for somebody who has at least some knowledge of the piano? I don't know. I mean, I everything is difficult and everything is easy at the same time. It's just a matter of how much time you spend and how how deep you go. Last year, I played this piece. I don't even know. I mean, between 10 and 20 times, I think 14 or 15 times. I played it with some great orchestra. I played with the Berlin Philharmonic. And I, I and people can actually watch that on the digital concert hall if they're interested. But I, I did I did it sort of throughout uh, throughout Europe, actually. And I'm doing it with John next month in, in Prague for the Prague Festival, Prague Spring. Um, I don't think it's impossible. Um, but if you ask, me that question when I was learning the piece in 2020 uh, the answer might have been different <laughs> but it's just it, it, it just sort of it just it's grown into something the logic of the piece is immense and so strong and I love the narrative and it's well written for the piano uh, so so and, and the orchestra is just fantastic uh, so I don't know I mean it's it's a bit like Stravinsky in how it feels to learn it you know it's intense logic uh, but uh, so much brilliance um, and I just love in that piece how, how many different elements come together. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of bebop in the harmony, actually. And, and there's, uh, I mean, there's Americana, there's a honky-tonk piano. Uh, my favorite movement is still, I think, the second movement, which is this strange night music. But, I mean, so gorgeous. And then the obsession, you know, third movement, of course. You know, it just, just, it just, I mean, for me, the piece flies by. It just sort of like, I start to play it and then somehow it's over. Um, it's, and still it's about half an hour. Uh, but that's always a good sign for a piece. And it's in one movement even. So it's, it's for the audience. It's like, it's like 30 minutes of life. Like it's, it's like a big Mahler movement to listen to. And those are long. But I think John's is shorter somehow. It feels shorter. Right. Um, in 2017, you did a rapid fire interview for, for, uh, Deutsche Grammophon's YouTube channel. At least that's where I saw it. And you were asked to choose between original and remix. And your answer, you know, six years ago was original. Now you have other artists who are taking your works um, from, 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 from afar and they are now reworking it. So I'm wondering, has your perspective changed on original versus remix? Not that they're doing remixes. These aren't dance versions of what you're doing, but they are new interpretations and new uses of your playing. Well, um, I think that I like to do the remix myself, even as a pianist, you're kind of remixing, you know, if you're an interpretive musician and, and you take your thing seriously, when Rachmaninoff played Chopin, he's effectively remixing it. He changes everything almost in the dynamics and he does it so freely. So if we just take it on a, a sort of broader scale, I mean, we are all remixers here in the classical world, uh, but, but, um, but I think uh, I've come to appreciate this process of reversing the creative process, my creative process, which is to take the works of others and sort of try to lend them my meaning and, and connect with my world and my experiences and bring that to the audience and then to take or to the studio and then to actually take that and give that as material to the composer. It's basically reversing the creative process, giving them my recordings or just prolonging the chain of creativity. Um, so. I think it's, it's very interesting. It's a little bit humbling for me to, to do it because you have to sort of just let loose and let go of your creations, which are my recordings, which are very dear to me and matter to me very much. I put so much into them. I mean, I'm not gonna say they're like my children, but, but, but there's that degree, you know, I, I really 
I really, you know, put everything into those. So to give them to composers and just tell them you can do whatever you want with this, you know, you can turn it upside down, you can make it sound horrible, you know, you, it, it's it's on your plate now. Uh, that's an interesting process for me and a little bit of an exper experiment in letting go of my maybe ego, I guess. I sort of feel like these are, this is the 21st century answer to transcriptions. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, and I've had incredible, I mean, I, of course, I select more or less, uh, you know, the people who do this and I, and I invite them to do it. So usually it's people that I'm taken with one way or another, or something about them that strikes me as, as interesting and brilliant. And we've just had two new reworks, you know, released just in the last weeks, you know, um, an amazingly beautiful lullaby by this Icelandic singer, Alfeder Erla Guðmundsdóttir. Uh, she's just sort of like written a lullaby with an Icelandic text for her young new newborn son uh, on top of, you know, material from Brahms Intermezzo, Opus 116, number four, and uh, which is my favorite Intermezzo. It's my recording um, from, from a far album. And it was, I think it's magically beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with it. And, and now, you know, uh, there's a new one that came out, I think just last week, uh, the, the Plover and the Raven. By Snorri Hadgrim song, which is also absolutely fantastic, just as an electronic composition, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. So, so I'm, I mean, this is great. I mean, of course, I'm very fortunate that anyone has interest to do something like this with my material. So, I'm going to continue with this, I'm sure. You know, in a relatively short period of time, you've gone from starting to make a name for yourself to being referred to as the new superstar of classical music or Iceland's Glenn Gould. And I'm wondering how you navigate your way through that kind of praise, or if you subscribe to what Mozart is quoted as having said, which is, I pay no attention, whatever, to anybody's praise or blame. I simply follow, I simply follow my own feelings. Well, he did pay attention a lot, because you can read that in the letters. <laughs> I know. The fact, the fact is that everyone wants to say this, but it's usually not true. Um, we all are aware to one to a degree of, of, of the noise around us. Um, Actually, what you said is that I'm 39, so it can't be, you know, that fast that I have ascended. I mean, I'm, I'm the, the thing is that this is true that that Deutsche Grammophon signed me in 2016, and and um, it's it's been rapid in that sense, you know. Uh, and I I acknowledge that, and I'm more than grateful for it. But before that, I was 32 when I signed with them, and it's not like I started to play the piano when I was 31. So I actually had those eight years between my studies and this contract that I signed which was just the beginning anyway of that chapter in my life I had eight years where I was quite desperate and very lonely um I was from I'm, I am from Iceland um uh, I chose you know my own path and I absolutely fundamentally rejected and do reject the notion of music competitions as a creative output uh or a way to grow yourself I mean I, I think it's 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 a dangerous game to play um but on the other hand I came from a place where there was no one to connect me in any way to the international network of music. So there was no international, say, conductor or a famous composer or international soloist even. You know, there was no one who could even give anyone a call and say, yo, listen to this guy. Um, so in a way, I, I had this weird situation for those eight years uh, where I was world famous in Iceland and more or less completely unknown outside of Iceland and that is a problematic situation to find yourself in and then there are like local people who are like you know love to tell you that oh you're just a local boy you're nothing you haven't done anything in the wider world you know of course I love to prove them wrong but but you know but I, I had moments of, of painful sort of episodes where I where I just couldn't understand how to break through um, but at the same time what this did was, I mean, I still played concerts, but they were like for 50 or 100 people in the middle of nowhere in Scandinavia. Everything was word of mouth. I didn't have a manager until I was 31, you know, let alone a great manager. No, 30, actually, sorry. But I, I mean, I had no one with me except my girlfriend, who's now my wife, and maybe my family. And, but, but that gave me still time to, to just play so much Bach, so much Mozart, Chopin, Beethoven. Those were my four sort of cornerstone composers that helped me um, in a way, modulate myself from from maybe being a student of wonderful teachers at, at Juilliard and elsewhere uh, to to kind of becoming my own teacher. But that is a process that doesn't happen overnight. And when you had piano lessons from the age of four or five, 
or whatever it is until you're 24 like I was when I had my last lesson um it doesn't happen next week that you are just your own sort of master you know that really takes time and the problem with competitions is that you know young professionals or students they very often play music that has been you know taught to them by someone else and then they go into the competition and they want to please a committee uh rather than you know pleasing their music and i think you know the one thing that the great composers of the past basically all have in common is that they've always been pleasing the music rather than anyone else Mozart is maybe the first, you know, a romantic artist in the sense that he actually breaks away from the aristocracy who rejects him, of course. But 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 he he he's writing, you know, those pieces on my program are more or less written music for the sake of the music rather than to please an aristocrat, you know. Uh, Schubert had, for instance, a much more contrasting thing where he was always trying to write lavender and doing those kind of like simpler mm -hmm. tunes, you know, to please and just to earn a living. But I think I think I think this is the key, you know, and 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 this is, you know, for young people, this was also the key for me. So in my darkest moments, when I really had absolutely no income, and and I was just suffering a little bit from playing what I thought was a, a very high level. I mean, to be honest, but but still to have no one listening to it except people back home. Um, I'm now grateful for that, but of course I wasn't at the time and I was absolutely desperate um, to get a stage. But you know, I also learned that you have to play every small performance you do like it is your Carnegie Hall debut. You know, uh, you have to play for 50 people in a church somewhere on a crappy piano and you somehow have to play like you imagine, you know, young Horowitz on his Carnegie night. You know, it's it's like you have to try. I mean, that's not what you're necessarily going to be capable of doing, but you have to have that attitude that everything matters and every concert is kind of sacred. That it could, you know, potentially be life changing for you and 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 perhaps for the audience. You know, and and then, you know, people will start to notice you. Uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to sustain that. I was lucky enough that I had kind of an artist salary from the Icelandic government. It's a wonderful system they have which is about $2,000 a month. It's actually, I mean, that's what it was. I don't know what it is now. Uh, that's not a lot of money, but it was enough for me to live in my studio and not have to do anything else. You know, uh, I, I managed, so I got by with that, you know. And in retrospect, I'm so grateful for that, you know, and, and I think we should do more to support, you know, more, uh, a bigger group of young people who are finishing their studies and making that modulation or transition into becoming young professionals. And I think that we should perhaps not you know, give those huge cash prizes to people like me or or people, you know, pe pe people who are sort of higher up in the hierarchy of, of the music world, but rather, you know, uh, all these maestros and, 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 you know, established people, we should maybe consider doing foundations that, that would, you know, have this kind of artist salary for the young people who are finishing their high schools, perhaps, no, sorry, colleges, perhaps with, you know, student debt and to allow them not to have to spend all the time just earning a level living by teaching children in the neighborhoods you know that that if they choose to do it differently that they have the option of doing that you know right now i know we're now, no one is going to give me a prize ever again because I said <laughs> this. <laughs> this <is> great. <laughs> i i have a i have a feeling that's not going to happen mm -hmm. um, i know we're a few minutes over do you have time for one more question mm -hmm. great um you know a lot of people are are eagerly anticipating your goldberg variations which, it, which I believe is is coming down the pike sometime in the not too distant future. Um, sure. So I know that this, we've already talked about how important Bach is to you. Um, and he was asked about playing a musical instrument. And he said, there's nothing remarkable about it. All one has to do is hit the right keys at the right time <laughs> and the instrument plays itself. Now that strikes me as a gross oversimplification of playing music, but is there any part of what Bach said that you could agree with, or is there truly something remarkable about playing music that you would say in response to him? Well, you have to remember the guy who's saying this is the greatest composer in history of music. So for him, the comparison between what I do, which is to play the music and what he did also, and he also did, of course, and what he then also did, which is to write the music and come up with the same Matthew passion. Uh, I can agree with him that in comparison, what I do is, pretty feeble i mean it's pretty 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 weak you know it's not it's not incredible actually having said that uh i actually think you know some of my favorite musicians of today are not necessarily composers uh but rather you know some of the greatest performers alive who can you know bring new life to the music 
you know, which can be more original than a new composition by a composer who doesn't have, you know, a strikingly interesting point of view, which is, you know, many composers. Uh, but you need, of course, you know, but so, so but you know, the Bach, the Bach, I, I agree with Bach. I think, you know, when, when in his case, uh, that's true. I mean, if you can imagine writing the Goldberg variations and then you see someone playing the Goldberg variations, of course, you think that's a simple task of playing them as opposed to coming up with them. But I love the art of, you know, the interpretive arts. And that's also in theater. And I love, you know, it's like, I love actors. I love, I love and, and, you know, being a pianist is a little bit like being an actor. Or I love ballet dancers. I love the art. I don't necessarily only love the choreographers or the screenwriters or, or, or the composers or, or, or those people. You know, I, I, I love people who manage to bring something here and now. And I think that, you know, I would be interested to hear if this was actually what Bach thought, you know, but of course, it would have been difficult to be him because he also suffered from from lack of recognition. You know, imagine here is history's greatest, not even composer, I think greatest artist, uh, everyone included, in my opinion, I think he is the biggest. Um, and I and, 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 and yet, you know, he only had about four books published in his whole lifetime. He didn't travel anywhere. He was he didn't have any money, you know, and much of his writing that we have is all about complaining about lack of salary or something like that. So, I mean, who knows, maybe he had an off day, <laughs> but I mean, but I, but I, but I also believe he's right, you know, compare those two facets of his life and certainly, you know, playing the music is nothing compared to writing it in his case. Well, you know, well, I must, I, but I must say that, you know, when you have some of my favorite performers in history, people like Sergei Rachmaninoff, the pianist, you know, the early Horowitz, uh, Alfred Cocteau in the early recordings, you know, uh, those those kinds of people, Glenn Gould in his early work as well, you know, those kinds of people, they they have one thing in common, Carlos Kleiber for conducting, they approach the music from a composer's standpoint and, and they're so free with the music because they almost go to the source of of, 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 of the music, you know. It seems to me that they, they almost understand how the music came to be and can then recreate it as if they had almost composed it. Shostako, uh, sorry, Rachmaninoff playing Chopin is, I think, the most authentic Chopin you can hear, but it's also the one that's, you know, starts further, most far, further, farthest away from the score in terms of dynamics, in terms of so many things. He's not afraid of changing things. He recomposes it like a rework almost, uh, but it's still so authentic. But it is a meeting between Rachmaninoff and Chopin, just like uh, you could say the same about the early Horowitz recordings and Horowitz plays the Mendelssohn leader on the some of the greatest you know recordings in history um that's a meeting between him and Mendelssohn did Mendelssohn imagine it like that I'm not sure ask John Adams or Thomas Adams if they always predicted everything the people who play their music today are going to do and I, I don't think the answer is going to be yes I think that composer can very well not be aware of certain things about the music you know the music has its own life somehow it's just like your children, I think, for composers sometimes, you know, you, of course, you know your child better than everybody and you created it. It's your DNA. But the child still has facets to that that you, you don't know. And that will always be the case. Right. Well, I have a feeling we could talk for hours. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. So thank you for taking the time.